What's up, everybody? Josh and Joe here from Ramrod's Archery, and you are watching Follow Through. In this episode, we're talking to German national team member Katarina Bauer, who just won Team Gold at the World Championships. Kathy has been doing very well the last couple of years. She made it all the way up to number one in the world rank. However, she had a pretty big injury last year and a lot of challenges preparing for this big season of getting Olympic quota spots and prepping for the world championships. So we follow her and talk with her through those challenges and how she managed to overcome them and how she and her team did so well this year at the world championships. So there's a lot of good info. So make sure you watch until the end where Kathy also reveals how she likes to set up her stabilizers. Let's get into it. So my, my first question is, Kathy, first of all, tell us about your year so far with shooting and um, and what you've been working on, what you've been learning, and and just give us some, some background going into the World Championships. Okay, yeah, my year was quite difficult because um, over the winter I got an injury in my hand, in my right hand, um, and let's say the, the first month it of the season everything was good then i got the injury and well i did not listen to my body i just continued to shoot because i wanted to shoot uh, in the world indoor series in Nîmes and also in las vegas um because i felt like i am on a good form so yeah um i did both i shot quite good but after las vegas i had um yeah a lot of pain and i had to quit I had to make a break from shooting for four weeks. So it was straight before the outdoor season started. And it was really hard because I couldn't do anything. I could not, next to archery, I normally um, go to work. I could not work because I could not move my hands. I could not shoot. I just was in um, a rehab clinic uh, every day to work on my, on my, yeah, my hands. <laughs> so it was really, really hard. And I had to, um, I had to skip the World uh, Championship trial, the first one. I also had to skip like um, our tuning process and everything for the boats. And my season started right before the first international competition. It was the Grand Prix in Le Chal. So it was really hard and I kept fighting and going. And yeah, I, the process, I made a great process during the season, but I felt like after the World Championship, my form increased and it was like kind of too late so it's it was a bit frustrating season but i learned that i have to listen to my body and the body said to me that i have pain and it's not nothing like normal pain like muscular things and um, i should have listened to it and i should just make the break when i had the pain and yeah that's what i learned from this season but all in all i'm i'm happy because i shot new pb um in the last World Cup, in the qualification, I finished two times in the 1-8 final. I I won gold with my team uh, at the World Championship, so it was a good end of the season. Yeah, that's a that's a crazy story, and I'm curious. You, so, is it in your draw hand? Yes, it's in my in my right hand, in my draw hand. Okay. And is it like a wrist or a finger or like in the middle of the hand kind of mm. issue? It's like here, <laughs> and okay. um, but the thing is that we still don't know what it is exactly, because at first they said, yeah, there's something broken and we have to do a surgery to fix it. The next doctor said, no, we don't need to do a surgery. So uh, I was like, I had two completely different opinions and I decided to go the way without the surgery and just uh, try to do it with physio and like a lot of training for the, for the wrist. And yeah, it worked out. I still, unfortunately, I still have pain, but just if I do like high volume of training. So after we have nationals in a few days and afterwards, I will do another scan of the hand and I will check again and we will hopefully find a way to get done with this pain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and regarding the, the four weeks you took off from shooting and work. Um, in order to try to to let it rest and do the rehab mm -hmm. at the same time, 
did that um, make a huge difference? Like when you came back four weeks later, it was like significantly less or was it still like a little bit of a, of a big problem? Mm, the the hands still made problems, unfortunately. Um, the mm -hmm. I, let's say the the big pain was wasn't there anymore, but it was like yeah, still a small pain. Um, mm -hmm. And before the break, I had the pain like the whole time. Also, when I was brushing my teeth, or when I was working, or when I was using my phone. But after the break, it just um, started to be painful during shooting. Um, after a couple of shots, it started, but it, it was done then and started after training for one hour and then it was away again. So it's, it's really strange. And that's why the doctors think it's something with the nerve. It's nothing, um, oh, okay. specific in the hand. It's a nerve thing and we don't know if it comes from there, there, there. So, um, oh. we have to check. And did you have a, an acute injury, like a specific injury where you started feeling this or was it slowly increasing over time? Like last year? Um, I had like a specific moment um, during um, a, a strength exercise where you have to hold your body weight on one hand and um, like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, it started to, this pain started when I did this, but I continued. And um, after afterwards, I was saying to the to our team, yeah, I have pain, and they everyone said, and also myself, yeah, it's just like maybe the muscle muscles every let's do physio and everything will be fine. But yeah, I was shooting a lot because it was over the winter, and over the winter I'm doing like really high volumes, like four or five hundred errors a day. And yeah, and this was made, this was the problem, not the injury itself, but, uh, that I did not stop, that I did continue with a lot, with a high volume. I imagine that now that, that you all have won the world championships and gotten your Olympic spots, everything feels so different than it did <laughs> probably six or eight months ago when every team, including yours, I, I presume is is looking forward to this year as being a very big year pre preparing for the Olympics and trying to get your spots that there must be so much stress associated with wanting to work hard as much as possible. And sometimes it's easy to look back and say, Oh, well, I needed the rest, but there was so much pressure or stress or focus at the time of we've all worked many years. This is a, a prime time where we all have to be in top form. And can you, I guess, can you describe a bit more of, um, what it was like at that time of, of the, the feeling of around shooting versus not shooting, training a lot versus having to take a break? Yeah, it was, it was like really, really hard because, uh, I had to take the break and I couldn't do like anything. It was from, I came back from Vegas, I was on a high and then it, I fell down because I couldn't do anything. And so the first days where I was phoning with my coaches and with the psychologists and because I did not know what I should do now. <laughs> and I, as, yeah, you will also know if you don't have anything to do, your head is going like, yeah. And then I see all others, especially from my team, which were training, which did also, we have um, in, uh, at this time, we also have like a big a boat tuning week where we have like um yeah high speed cameras and everything to test and we can test our arrow spines we can test our bows and that's like one of the most important weeks of the year to prepare for the new season and i was at home and i was just lying on the laying on the couch and on the sofa and did nothing and um i i felt like i was doing nothing but of course i was in the in it's in rehab um, every day from nine to three in the afternoon to prepare. And um, so I got a new team <laughs> there because the, my coaches and the physios there, they are really, really cool. And they are also really into sports. And I also met a lot of great people there, which are having like the same thing as me. So it was a good experience, but it was really hard, of course. And 
the it was like the world championship was so close but this injury took it away from me and i did not know i knew okay there will be the world championship trials and i at this time i was world number one but this doesn't give me anything this this doesn't give me my place for the world championship and um so i knew the the first trials i have to skip but i have a chance at the second trials to yeah to show the coaches that i'm still able to do it but it was like this day and you have to be ready for this day and i could just wait and wait 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 and do everything but um yeah it was really hard <laughs> It's bringing back some memories now talking with you at uh, Las Vegas when we met um, in February and how stressful that was and how you were is still in the middle of trying to figure out <laughs> what, what what the issue was and what you were going to do and, and what you had to do either for your training or your testing or, or ability to make teams. And uh, I, I know uh, all of us were stressed out here for you on your behalf <laughs> too, knowing like that... <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a very very difficult position to be in and um we're we're really happy that that it's it's improved um for you and and that you all have done so well at the world championships but i just want all our listeners to know that this was not guaranteed by any means yeah. like there was so much uncertainty and uh and it it was a testament i think to all your your all's hard work and determination to 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 have the performances that you've had because it's uh this this was a, as amazing as I'm sure the world championships have been for you all I I think you would probably be a little hesitant to go through this whole year again based on how <laughs> challenging it was and how uncertain it was yes and it was like um when I came in the trial it was my first trial of the year so I was super nervous because it was like I came out of my little health health circuit they put me into the trials and I was there like okay hi teammates I I don't know how to do it because I haven't practiced so much like you and I was really um not confident because normally I'm a confident person and I always try to believe in myself but there it was super hard and um we have the trials um, took four days and after the first three days I was on the last position and I mean, of course, I was already before the last day, I knew I have to make a really, really good day to come in the top three or maybe in the top two. Um, the first place wasn't um, possible anymore. So, um, yeah, it was really, really stressful. And the last day I, I was really, really good. So I fought my way back into the top three and then um, I saved my spot. But um, yeah, this was an, also a new experience for me uh, because I've never felt this inconfident um, as there before. Yeah, yeah. I uh, again, I, I think it's important for everybody to hear that because we we tend to have a vision. I think a vision we create for ourselves of what our lead up to the Olympics will be like about what our lead up and preparation for teams will be like. But uh, I know it's, it's not just you in this situation. I'm sure there's dozens or hundreds of, of archers, not to mention athletes around the world who mm. have um, just unexpected challenges and surprises that really throw their, their, their confidence into question of, of how is this, how, how am I going to continue? How is this possible? How can I still make this work in the face of all this uncertainty and, and, um, and yeah, a lot of challenges faced. And, and again, we're, we're really happy and, and, uh, look up to you and all your teammates for persevering through a lot of these things, uh, for sure. Because again, I think, uh, we have a lot of respect for, for what archers go through on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. And, and this is uh, quite exceptional as as the things you've had to face this year. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, that's 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 really intense. Um, that's a, a crazy background to this whole year. Um, your injury last year, all the challenges as it's progressively gotten a little worse over the winter. So while you're having to take this long break, obviously um, 
everyone's going to have to deal with the mental challenge that comes with that in their own way. Um, but given um, the situation of I can't use my hand at all, I can't shoot my bow at all, were there any um, archery-related mental or physical types of training that you were trying to keep up with while you're waiting for your wrist to heal that didn't aggravate your wrist? Yes, there were a lot because um, my mission was to, after the four weeks, I wanted to start with my original draw weight because I said I don't have time to uh, reduce and increase again. And I, I really made it in the end, by the way. So I started to um, to watch um, some matches for myself every day um, to get into this feeling of um, yeah, of archery. And I also tried to um, to take like 10 to 15 minutes every day um, to visualize my shot process. And I was really, um, yeah, whenever I had time, I don't know, I was thinking about shooting and about some yeah movements or for example i try to feel like the the contact of the string on my nose just without having the contact but i try to get this feeling and i think this helped me a lot because after the four weeks i had kind of panicked that i i will i'm not able to pull my bow but it was um it was like i've never made a break it was really interesting and I also talked with the psychologist about this and they said that um, it's like when you're shooting mentally, it's like you're shooting in real life. So this can help and I would recommend everybody if you're on holiday or something and you don't want to lose a lot of strength, then um, just try to visualize and think about shooting or watching some videos um, of your shooting on your phone or whatever. It's um, a really great tool. For everybody yeah just keeping your mind in archery mode even if you're not really shooting keeping those feelings fresh remembering what you want to feel like what you want to look like yeah that's really good did did you have any kind of uh, general fitness things that you were you were able to keep up with during the break like anything in the gym or lower body workouts or cardio or anything like that yeah we um in the rehab i was doing a lot of uh Oh, like I was, I was there to do fitness exercises, uh, but it was really difficult because we could uh, do nothing which was on the right side. So, um, also when I did like cardio running or something, my hand started to hurt because it was, mm. it came from here. So we did a lot. <laughs> I learned uh, so many new exercises for myself also with them. Um, um, not with like a lot of weight before the injury. I trained with um, with weights, and now I'm training more with elastic bands or with um, body weight because it just helps me to to fix my problems <laughs> and my weaknesses. I'm curious going going forward a little bit in the year from I guess the spring through the summer. Did you start gaining more confidence? Did you start feeling like you had actually gotten stronger or better in some ways that might have led to achieving a personal best after such a, a challenging winter? Yes, I think there were many small things which came together slowly. At first I was there and I was not confident in the wind. So I had one competition where I gained much more confidence because I shot good scores in the wind. Maybe I did not win a medal, but I think it's not always about winning medals if you learn so much. So from competition to competition, I learned more. And um, also from the team competitions, I got a lot of confidence uh, for my individual rounds. And because my my team gave me a really good feedback. And um, right before the World Championship, they also said things to me like, you are you're a great archer, we know, and um, we don't care about your injury. And we don't care about your break. We know that you can shoot uh, tens now for for our team, and this really helped me to get back my confidence and to go on the shooting line. And um, I, yeah, I just knew that I'm able to shoot tens in every circumstances. So um, the personal best it was in the qualification at the World Cup in Paris. I shot six uh, seventy. And yeah, it was, like I said, my personal best. And I also 
um, made it into the 1-8 final, where I lost in a really close shoot-off. So, yeah, I finally found back my form, but it was the end of the season, so it's okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that that's that's a uh, a long journey in a short period of time. Um so I I'm curious just just kind of how you were talking about rounding out Paris with a personal best. What do you think you'll be taking into uh into next year, next year's uh training schedule, next year's preparation that um that you learned specifically from everything that happened this year that you think will be an improvement? Well, I learned a lot. <laughs> But um, I think um, the most important thing for me is to to trust the process. To if there are weeks um, when nothing goes the right way, um, because there will be weeks where you just don't feel like you're making improvement. You just have to hold the vision and trust the process. Because in archery, if you train today, you won't be good tomorrow, and you also won't be good next week you will see the the results of something in a few months. So, um, and this also showed me this year because I started to work hard in like in March or in ap April and four, four months later, I saw the results. So I think um, this, I hope that this makes me more calmed down and more relaxed because next year will be intense with um, the Olympic Games and stuff. I know that our trials for the Olympic Games will be really early in the season, like uh, in March and April. So I have to be ready already in March. <laughs> and I have to hold this or increase, even increase until if I make it until August, until the Olympic Games. So this will be really stressful for the mind. But um I learned this year that I have to trust myself and I have to trust my hard work. And um, if I work hard every day, I can know that I gave everything I had. And if I make it, then it's great. And if I don't make it, then it's, it has to be okay because then the others just did better. Yeah, this, this is, um, again, another challenge that I think uh, a lot of athletes are dealing with mentally on a regular basis. And, and this brings up two points that I, that I think are really, really valuable. Um, the first one is, is like you're saying, trusting this process. And I presume that you work with your coaches, your, uh, you know, physiotherapists, your, your psychologists, uh, other archers, teammates, all the people, you know, in your support group to craft the most, um, the best strategy for you as an individual that you guys can imagine. Um, and it, it, it won't work overnight. You, like you're saying, you mm -hmm. have to, you have to trust it. You have to keep working this, this process in order to see the results later. And I think that's challenging because it really does depend, I think, upon communicating with all these people and planning in order to be able to trust that. Because I could, I think we've seen a lot of athletes who, uh, sometimes they, they don't trust the process enough and they don't work through it all the way to see the results. But then sometimes I think there's also athletes who don't have a, maybe need to pivot, maybe need to change their strategy a little bit, or maybe yeah. need to change the process in order to, um, in order to have something that makes a, a bit more sense or works better because there's, there's parts of this process that aren't working. And that's not something that we can ever say 100% is right or wrong. And I presume even if we go back to, to your process over the winter where you were trying to continue to follow that, even with the injury, <laughs> there was that, that challenge and that, that real tension um, and that uncertainty with, with, I know I need to keep following this in order to see the results, but maybe something has changed so dramatically that I need to change my strategy and my process and my training a little bit. So um, I, I, it's it's never something that I don't think can be answered 100% for any athlete in any situation. But without crafting the best process you can and without trying to trust in it and give it a, a real chance to work, you have almost yeah. no chance. I feel like that's the only way to, to have the best chance you can. So I, I think that's really powerful for people to, to see that even at an elite level, um, there, there's a lot of uncertainty and planning and trust that has to go into 
each month, each uh, half a year, each year to be able to have, you know, your best performances. So yeah, that, that was one of the things that I think was super powerful. And the other thing, I th oh, the idea of, like you said, a lot of your hard work and, and uh, training, you saw the results four months later in Paris with your personal best. But like you said, you also have to have your best be at the trials. So you have the, uh, the trials being a period where you need to peak and the Olympics being a period you need to peak. And I think that's something that um, we've seen maybe more amateur archers kind of just go out and train. They try and do their best all the time, but really we can't be at our best every day, every week. Yeah. Um, like you're saying, if you have to put in a lot of work, you're going to be tired the next day. You're not going to shoot as well. It's going to, it's going to take some time to recover in the body to get used to that. And as we go throughout the season with some of our biggest matches and biggest points in our, in our year or career, um, we need to have a plan to be able to say, I'm going to be training really hard for the strength, a bit more for the mental preparation, and then kind of peaking towards a competition and be really prepared for that. And then go back into that same kind of, you know, reflective, uh, and, and, uh, analysis of how that competition went. Now we build up some strength again. Now we're getting back into our, our training and competition mindset. And then now we're peaking again for the Olympics. So I don't, I don't know if you have any particular thoughts, Josh, on things you've seen people do or where you see the value in incorporating more of the, uh, I, I forget the term. It's not periodization, like periodization mindset. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, obviously, Kathy is very well aware of the the importance of this, and probably a lot of the high level athletes we talk to are. But I do think, um, both for myself and other younger archers that I've worked with, and, and earlier in my shooting, it definitely felt like there was always pressure that you you had to work hard, but every single training day that wasn't good could sometimes feel like an indicator that you're not on the right track and something's wrong and taking too much feedback on the results or performance from just one day in isolation uh, it can make it really hard to commit to a longer term training plan that's going to really get you to where you want to go and it's going to encourage you to kind of keep changing every single day or every single week to something different and so if you don't have that real commitment to a longer term strategy because we're too narrow and focusing on one day or one week, you can miss out on the real benefits that do come with periodizing training over time, letting yourself kind of get worn down, worn down, build up, build up, and then have a period of, of a little bit of recovery where we see that performance come back up again. Um, that is a game changer for performance. Um, mm -hmm. And if you if you can't just at least go through like one good year cycle of training this way, or even at least six months where you're just ignoring the day-to-day -day results and just focusing on uh, a good, clear process that we're following, you're, you're never going to get to test that out, right? So, so I would say if somebody hasn't really tried committing to a good six to 12 month uh, training plan with periodization built in it, um, yeah. I think we have proof right here that, that this can work if you trust <laughs> yeah. it and stick with it. Yeah, yeah, the rest is just as important as the hard work and the training for strength and volume is just as important as the tapering of the uh, of the training to really fine tune it into that peak of performance for competition, scoring, matches and tournaments. Yeah. I also had to learn this this year because before this before my injury, I was like a high volume girl. <laughs> So I like to to shoot a lot of arrows also before uh, competitions when we had like go when we went to a World Cup it's like official training day and then it's qualification day and I I always shot like two times a day and hundreds of arrows before the qualification round so um yeah and this year it was not possible so I also had to learn how to yeah how to do it with the periodization um, with a yeah a lower volume and yeah, it was also a new experience for me and it's super important to make these uh, recovery weeks and also to like before competitions and the weeks before you have an important competition to just like do high quality shots to do more competition simulations it's much better to shoot less arrows but with a higher quality 
then to just shoot, shoot, shoot. And because then you come to a competition and you're like, okay, how, how, how should I shoot this uh, 72 arrows? And if you do it in training, like every day, just 72 arrows in the morning, 72 in the afternoon, you will be even more ready. I I promise. <laughs> yeah, I think that's great advice for training and coaching and uh, managing your yourself as an athlete is to get is it yeah be able to get in that mindset, get in that uh, that skill set of competition versus just large amounts of training, getting strong, working on some structural or technical technical stuff. So yeah, I think that's really important for a lot of people to to hear. Yeah, and and two, if someone's in a situation where whether it's because of a work thing or it's a school thing, it's an injury, whatever the reason may be, where they are forced to shoot a lower volume for a while. Um, I think that's a good opportunity to really practice that quality over quantity. Yeah. Because if you, if you know I only get to shoot 70 arrows today, you're going to make every single one of those arrows count and you're going to you're going to find some way to improve your shot, improve your focus and improve your overall connection to your process in 70 arrows cuz you don't have a choice. Some I mean I I'm definitely not hating on high volume. High volume is important. I think everybody has to have those days to build up the strength to kind of really get beat your body up and and get to know how it works. But, um, I think the balance of having some days where you do just go super high on the quality and just a few arrows, those days can be just as valuable as the high volume yeah. days. Yeah. And I like, I, this year I started to, because after the injury, I knew that I'm just allowed to shoot 100 arrows a day before I was allowed to shoot as much as I was able to. <laughs> so until the sun goes down. But I knew I just have 100 arrows, but I have 24 hours. So I tried to, yeah, to find a way to use this 100 arrows as useful, to be as useful as possible for me. So I like, I started in the morning with just two practice ends. Then I made 36 arrows and um, scoring. Then I took a break. And in the afternoon, I did like kind of, kind of the same. And um, just to, yeah, to have it, like you said, uh, on a high quality standard. Well, that's, that's a lot of good stuff. I, I know I'm being reminded of a lot of things that, um, that I'm sure we've talked to some archers about or, or coached some archers on. Um, but yeah, this is, this is a, uh, a masterclass a little bit, I'm sure <laughs> in, um, in, in facing challenges, in having real constraints on your, your training, having a lot of uncertainty and then having to still progress because we can't change the timeline of tournaments and and world championships and Olympics to to our uh, liking, unfortunately. Um, so sometimes uh, athletes, I think, uh, have to get have to get out of their comfort zone, and I don't want to say necessarily get creative, but they have to really think outside the box in terms of this whole idea is what I thought was going to happen. And it's, it cannot happen that way. There's no way. So now I need to really refocus and be flexible and, uh, talk to my people, talk to my support group, talk to my teammates and, uh, and, and follow what is, is possible with either the injury or the time constraints, um, of my training or, or the competition season. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that's really powerful stuff. And, and I think all the athletes we've talked to on the podcast, none of them have had quite so many challenges with, with injury or training so far this year. But yeah, so switching gears a little bit and looking more specifically at the world championships, we know that you were, uh, barely able, uh, in the last day to be able to make the team from a lot of your performance and having to, to dig deep, uh, without the, by any means, the ideal type of, uh, preparation scenario that you would have liked. So you, you made the team and what month was that, that you had the second trials for that tournament? Uh, the beginning of June, I think. Okay. Yes. So we had the trials and then one week later, the team headed to the European games, then to work at Medellin, then preparation training camp and then to the world championship. So it was really wow. cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so a crazy like five or six week period from June through the end of July, I presume. Um, 
So how, how are your feelings getting into now that you've made the team um, in June? How are your feelings going into the world championships or the other competitions and then leading up to the world championships? Yeah, I was really happy to make the team, of course. So, um, the, but the trials week, I was so exhausted after because it was mentally really, really exhausting. And there was not much time to breathe afterwards because we headed to the European Games. And um, going there, we had like really high expectations because, of course, our women's team was like one of the favorites because of last year. And we knew that the season until this point was not our best season, but we knew that we are still able to shoot good. And the European games were like really frustrating. <laughs> and my individual competition was, I don't know, was really, really bad. And um, afterwards we found out that there were some issues with my, uh, with my arrows, with my arrow spine. So I changed this. And in the team competition, we finished on fourth place, but we shot the highest average in team. So it was like, mm. yeah, it felt like not fair, but that's the game. So it was, in the end, it was okay. Um, so after the European Games, um, we had the training camp um, to prepare for the World Championships. And we were in, um, we trained at the Maifeld, where the World Champs um, were. So um, there we had a lot of talks with our psychologists and also, um, yeah, we had really good talks actually because um, especially the team competitions, like I said, were not the best this year. And we tried to do like a lot of um, group works about um, our teams, the women and the men's team. Uh, and in one session in the evening, we found out some things which we could improve like um there was a it was like a game and there were we were the women's team and um our psychologist she gave us like different topics and each of us had to give the topic a, a voting from one to ten like she said how is the team spirit in your team and then each of us had to say like 10 points nine points whatever and then we found some things where we were not the same opinion and so we after that, we went together and we talked about um, our different opinions and why we have these opinions. And um, yeah, we found out some points which were better the last season than this season. And we finally had also the time to discuss about things. And um, yeah, everyone could say what he, what she wished for during team competitions and this was really great. And I think this was the point where our women's team, especially, um, found the, like, the inner flame for the World Championship back. So we were super motivated and we just wanted the World Championship to start. We started to shoot a lot of team rounds um, at the, at the pre-camp. And um, we also had a lot of contact um, when we were not together. So like a good friendship and um, yeah, Coming to Berlin for the World Championship, we were really excited and we just wanted to do this together. And yeah, so it was it was a really interesting time because of the, I have to talk from the, the team, uh, team side. It was really, really nice to see how we increased during the season and um, how we did this together in the end <laughs> with a happy end. <laughs> Yeah, that that's I mean, I that that's very encouraging to hear. I know I'm getting a little goosebumps a little bit just listening to like how they're preparing for it and how you guys are are finding the communication. I think is so important amongst team members. We've seen so many teams that have the talent but they don't have the connection and they don't have they're not on the same page and and everybody's different. Like no two teams are going to be the same. No, even the same people are going to be different year to year, even if they're still together. And, uh, I don't think there's any perfect way to act with teams, but I think you, when you watch a team and how they talk to each other, how they shoot, how they interact with each other, you can tell if there is 
that that spirit, that connection, that being on the same page, and that building of each other's um, performance. Um, so the, I, I, I guess I take a lesson away from this as, as the communication and the space to be able to talk about how you feel, how you think about certain things and what you, what your hopes and fears are about different stuff. And then being able to take that into some of the biggest tournaments of the year, the biggest focal points that you all care so much about and are working towards, and then being able to, to, you can never guarantee a win. You can never guarantee a, a great performance, but you know that things are working. Like you can just tell in the way you're working with your team and your training that that stuff is really starting to come together and that the team is starting to have the performance and the belief in itself that it can win and it can beat very, very good teams out there in the world that arguably have better odds on paper, but yeah. but you can start to tell that um, if you were in the room, I presume with you guys training, with you guys communicating that, that this, uh, the odds of this team getting a medal have, have dra dramatically improved. Yeah. I think it's, it's, that's the point. This, it's just in team. It's like everyone can shoot tens, but if the communication in the team is like perfect, you can shoot tens in a row. And that's, that's the thing in the team, because you just have this one arrow, you go there, shoot and go back. And then their teammates have to do it. And if it's like one, uh, if you are like you know, together, it's then uh, there will be the like 10, 10, 10, 10. And also if uh, one, one person shoots like a bad arrow, the others, they really want to shoot a X afterwards because if you are in this together, you really want this even more. <laughs> So, and this was the feeling we had um, at the World Championship again, which I think we kind of lost at the competitions before. These, this feeling of we are there together and I'm on the shooting line for all three of us and I'm doing this for all three of us. And if one is doing a bad, uh, a bad shot, it doesn't matter because there are still two others. And um, yeah, this made this competition so good for us. I, I can speak for, for speaking for myself. I would say that team rounds were my favorite part of archery. I really did like the individual competition and challenges that came with being able to stand on the line, just yourself and, and shoot and try to win. But there was something that felt more motivating and easier to train hard, easier to, to stay outside of your own head and thoughts and connect with the other athletes on the team when you were shooting a team round. And especially in, uh, with friends or at international competitions where you have, you know, your whole team behind you and your, your support staff and you're representing your country. Um, and I, I would say at its very best, like you're talking about that communication, that motivation, that feeling that, somebody has your back and is, is able to step in and help you if, if you're not at your very best, but that also you can have somebody else's back and whatever the situation requires that you, you could shoot better than your personal best. You could shoot better than your average in order to help the team in that moment and, and get the win or get the win, the set or, or progress on and, and have a chance for a medal. Um, and that's, that's something I wish was even more a part of archery. I know that it, it exists at international competitions very regularly, but I, I know for myself, I wish it happened more even at local and, and national competitions because um, that feeling of being kind of part of the group and outside of yourself and your own mind is really exciting. You're just really clicking at a level that yeah. I think it's possible individually, but I think it's more enjoyable as a team. That's true. <laughs> We were so into this because, um, for example, it's a really funny story because the day before the team round at the World Championship, we were um, at the training field and we wanted to practice a bit, just a little bit. <laughs> and um, then the conditions were quite good. So we were like, okay, let's do a little challenge to, um, to stop the training. And every one of us said, okay, let's do it. And then um, Charlene Schwarz, she said, yeah, it's, um, the, the conditions are so good. It's easy for us to shoot a 55. If we shoot a 55 now, we can stop training. Okay. She said this 
and the wind came. <laughs> really, just a, a, <laughs> there a storm was coming, so it was really, really windy. And we said, no, we will shoot this this uh, 55, and then we will head to the hotel. Yeah, I think like 10 ends later, <laughs> we had to stop <laughs> training because the training field was closed <laughs> because there was yeah. rain and uh, wind and everything. And we shot um, eight ends um, in a row, 54. <laughs> 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 but we were like so, like we were super hyped to shoot team rounds and to do it together. And um, so that everyone was shooting until the practice field closed. And on the next day during the team competition in the, I think in the first or in the second end, we shot the 55 and we were like, we did it. <laughs> yeah. You got it done. Yeah. Yeah. That was the team spirit. That This shows uh, that every one of us three was 100% into this uh, team competition and into this quota tournament. Yeah. Shall we jump into some matches and see how this thing goes down? Uh, real quick, but but Maddie had a suggestion. Um, I think uh, we're curious, and I think maybe some other archers might be curious. What uh, what does the banana mean? <laughs> uh, the banana. It's like um, our team name, the Banana Crew, because uh, uh, during the last season, after we had a really good qualification round at the World Cup in, I think it was in Korea. Our coach, Mark Denbach, uh, gave us bananas, every one of us, and we did like um, cheers with the bananas. And um, some guys from World Archery and made some pictures. And the next competition, it was the same. We did the same, and there was another picture. And so I don't know why, but someone called us the banana crew. And so for the European Championship last year, I bought the the banana from uh, Mario Kart and it was our mascot <laughs> and <laughs> yeah but now the banana lives in uh, at the World Archery Center in Lausanne because our coach Mark Dellenbach he left the team after the World Championship and we gave him the banana as a present so we are not sure if we are still the banana crew or if we will find a new team name but this was the story of the banana crew. <laughs> okay, perfect. No, that's really fun. I feel like, yeah, you have to take advantage of uh, of the unique, enjoyable, <laughs> funny, interesting stuff that happens. And and that's uh, that's awesome. You can yeah, have a for, team mascot a little bit. Yeah, and for the World Championship, we even bought a, a little German a national dress for the banana. So she was um, perfectly dressed. For the world championship. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I like it. Let's uh yeah, let's maybe pull up some uh, some matches now that we're we've got all the backgrounds of the uh the competition. Have you watched these already or is this your first time rewatching them? I've watched um, them with my family one day after I came home uh with uh, like all my family and friends, but it's already like three weeks ago. So it's nice to see it once again. <laughs> All right. Well, here we go. So, so um, how did your your first matches of the day go leading up into the semifinals? Were the conditions good, bad? Yeah, the conditions were quite good. So it was a really nice day. It was not too windy, but uh, of course we were really excited because we knew that this is the this is their match um, for the Olympic quota. So if we n win this match, we knew that we have the quota places for sure. So this was really exciting and it was also exciting for me personally because I'm the first um, shooter in the team and I knew that um, I will shoot the, the first arrow in uh, the arena. I will start, so it was really, really exciting. <laughs> But this being the World Championships, it's got a huge, uh, huge stage. It's got more matches, and you're in front of the home crowd. So how did this feel? Yeah, this all you can see here, the blue ones, is family and friends of mine. So they came there with a big bus. Uh, they drove eight hours, and knowing that wow. they are there and supporting us uh, was just super, super great feeling. And um, yeah, it was just so nice and we tried to enjoy as you can see we were smiling the whole time and 
We were just so excited to get this day started. <laughs> and again, I presume and, that a yeah. lot of your preparation for this has made it more of a positive excitement than like a pressure excitement. Is that is that true? Yes, that's absolutely true. Because um, for me personally, it's like um, I learned that it's not important for me what others think about my performance. Uh, it's just important for me what my family and friends think about my think about myself, and I know that they love me. Uh, doesn't matter if I'm a world champion, if I'm an archer or not. They, they just don't care. So there's there's no pressure for me, um, and I know that they support me. Doesn't matter what I do. So uh, this uh, saying this to myself really helps. And this now was a really exciting moment because I was. I was super excited to start this match. <laughs> yeah. And it was a good yeah, start. Sure. So I was really, was really, See. really happy. Yeah. And then when so, yeah, I'm, I'm sure back, some I'm adrenaline and telling. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like the first error. It's, it's always really quiet in the arena. But before the first error of the whole day, it's like even more quiet. And so. Uh, when you're shooting a good arrow, then the the crowd gets loud, and that's what you want to hear when you're down there shooting. Yeah. So, yeah, and we had a really good start. We all three of us felt really confident and not too nervous, so we still could control our our shot and our uh, shot routine. And like here, Michelle told us some interesting things about the wind, uh, where she aimed off. Yeah, it was, it was really good. Okay. So yeah, I don't see the flags at the target moving very much, but what are what was she or you all seeing with the wind? Yeah, we were like um, feeling the wind on the shooting line and between the target and uh, the shooting line, there were some wind stops and they were moving and they also changed directions. So you had to be really focused and concentrated and... Um, watch the flags and also the wind socks um, for every arrow. So it could change arrow by arrow. Okay, okay. And this was, this was quite challenging. Yeah, we've definitely seen some matches where it's, where it's been tricky and sometimes archers aim off a little too quickly and should have just kind of kept trying to aim at the center, but then sometimes the wind is, is very important to pay attention to and um, you have to keep adjusting and, and again, in sync with your team on what you're feeling and seeing with your shot. Yeah, yeah. That was in the arena. It was like, normally you can trust also the person who shot in before you. So like um, when I was shooting, I told Charlene where to aim off. But in this arena, uh, the conditions changed um, the whole time. So sometimes mm -hmm. uh, she had to aim on the complete different side than me. So it was really, yeah, intense. <laughs> so we had to stay really focused. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. So even arrow to arrow, even if you, you got yeah. a good read and you got it in the, in the gold or in the 10, your the next athlete could be like, oh, it's changing. Like, don't do what I did. Yeah. You won't get the same result. Yeah, that's, that's true. And that was the, the most important thing in this, uh, in this matches to just um, stay in our Levy set bubble and just mm -hmm. focus shot by shot, arrow by arrow, and to communicate well. And um, during the set, we also tried to make this little circle. I don't know if you can see it in the video afterwards. Um, so during the taking the arrows, we were always in our circle and just um, talking about our game, not focusing on mm -hmm. anything else. Uh, yeah. 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 I think I've seen some more teams do that uh, more often of, of helping them maintain that positive energy and that focus on themselves and not get lose that by kind of watching the other team shoot. But um, but yeah, we see here that that Mexico, obviously a very talented team, is really struggling to to figure out where to aim. No arrows in the gold on the entire six first arrows. And whether or not they can come back for this set, that doesn't show a lot of confidence for, for getting dialed in for, you know, a match that can maybe be over in three sets. 
Yeah, because we also we went into this match. We knew that, or before we knew that Mexico are maybe it's the favorites in these uh, mm -hmm. semifinals in general. So they were like the team to beat, and um, so we said, okay, we have to do our thing, and we just want to focus on our target and on our shots. And um, yes, we also did not um, know that or did not expect them to struggle this much in the beginning, but now they're, they're coming back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're getting dialed in now. Yeah, and this of course gives more pressure. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, what, do you, what um, skills or, or things to focus on being the, the first shooter in, in your team when you step up to the line, what, what is unique about that first spot? For any athletes who might be new to team rounds or who might not know, mm -hmm. so for us it's like um, I'm like a really consistent shooter, so I'm normally not making big mistakes. So in, and I think it's really important for a shooter for the first shooter because I make the first shot. It should be consistent, and I should know where I aim to give my teammates a feedback. Um, and for us, it's like I'm the first, then it's Charlene, because she's a really, really strong shooter. And she's like the youngest of the team, so she's in our middle. And um, if, yeah, she always can make also a consistent shot and, yeah, makes a good middle. <laughs> and Michelle is like the, the one and only. <laughs> she always wants to shoot this 10, 100%. You always can see it in her face. And it doesn't matter if it's raining or if it's, it's stormy. She always wants to shoot this 10. And that's the most important thing about a, um, about the last woman in the team. Um, so, and she also, she doesn't care about if she doesn't shoot the 10. So you don't need someone who's always thinking, Oh, why did I, didn't I shoot the 10? She has to continue afterwards. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. So that's our okay. order to shoot. <laughs> Excellent. And I, I presume part of it too could be, I think your pacing of shot is, is relative, not only consistent in, um, in accuracy, but consistent in, in time and, and being quicker. And I imagine that adds up, um, match after match after match of having that first shooter be just a little bit faster to give more time, um, for the rest of the archers. Yes, that's also that's also a part. I forgot about this because yeah, I'm shooting like really fast, and also if you're shooting in new circumstances and there is, if it's like really windy, I don't have a problem to shoot in wind or in any conditions. I just do my shot really quick, so it's always a good feedback for the others in the team. And yeah, that's I think also really important. Okay. So yeah, it looks like Mexico has has come back, although they did finish with a 989 to get back to a 54. So you all started with a 28, but with a nine, you clinch it 55, 54. So this was a much closer end, but it feel, probably feels good to be up four zero. Yeah, and there you can see Charlene, it was the first moment when she said that she's a bit nervous. <laughs> because before we were all like, <laughs> we were like really, calm and yeah, now um, Charlie told us girls I'm nervous <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, we said to her yeah then the coach made like this to get the crowd louder to push us <laughs> yeah yeah it was it was really cool <laughs> yeah I'm sure everybody feels nervous and excited in their own ways and expresses it differently but but yeah, it's uh, it's kind of inevitable, and uh, I think it it also shows the excitement of being in a in a position that you want to be in, as far as being able to get to a big match. Um, we've often talked about how if if you didn't like yeah. archery, if you didn't care about it, you probably wouldn't feel as excited or as nervous as you do. So that's uh, something that doesn't come along in very many places in life, I guess. So it's it's something to be embraced rather than than worry about so much. Yeah. yeah, and I think the funny thing in such um, such situations like here in the semifinal is that you're not that nervous um, with your first arrow and also not at your second, 
but maybe with the third on, and fourth when you're like when you're having time to think about what you did what you've already done before um yeah you get more more nervous for me personally and i know also yeah. for the other girls <laughs> it was uh, yeah really cool yeah <laughs> Yeah, maybe being a little more focused on on thinking about winning or winning the set points and how critical some of each of yeah. these points are. But um but yeah, I also know some people can get real nervous on the on the first ones too and then they get in a little <laughs> bit more relaxed as the match goes on. So I guess it it all depends. Yeah. All right, yeah. so third end. Okay. So yeah, a little high on this one. Was... Nervous. Yeah. And it was also because okay. I I was really nervous and so I pushed it a bit high. And I also told the girls that it was my fault. Um, that's also a really important thing in the team round to just tell the others if it is your fault. Um, yeah. Yeah. To be able to give them clear information on where where was the pin when the shot went off or when the clicker, you know, the, the shot broke and the clicker went off. Or yeah. if you did something that you thought pushed or pulled or dropped or, or whatever to... You know, your best guess, you know, as far as you know, we can never be 100% certain, but that will allow them the confidence to say, ah, oh, yeah, I just, I, you know, that was me. That was just off a little bit. Just aim for the middle. It's, you yeah. know, you'll be good. Yeah. And that's maybe all, that's the most important thing in team rounds because it's not that you also shoot uh, the tens. It's also that you can tell the others how they can shoot tens. So, um, because, yeah, after my eight, the other shot two, two in the yellow, and that's, that's good. So, yeah, yeah, we did, like, the right thing. And now another end. It looks like you all are neck and neck with Mexico. Um, one point up at the halfway mark, but they have a 10-9 and maybe an 8. Uh, so, an eight. very beatable 54, I think. 53, Okay. So yeah. twenty seven to uh to win the uh match outright. Oh no, but they win five one, so they just need to tie? Okay. Yeah. Back in the yellow. Yeah. yeah. That's so exciting to watch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> When you're getting ready for team rounds, did you guys play around with a lot of different rotations with having someone else shoot first, someone else shoot last, or did you pretty much just go off of your personalities and what you like and just stick with that for, for the whole time? Yeah, we normally always stick with, uh, with this combination because we tested some other constellations as well, but this one was the best mm -hmm. during the European games. Nice and shot. I felt... Yeah, this was really nice. Oh. <laughs> oh. Great way to finish, yeah. Yes, that was the 10 from, you know, Michelle always, she really wants to shoot it. And if she shoots it, she's like, ah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Great. laughs> yeah. She's got that high energy. And of, yes, and there, the, the blue ones on the stand, it's all from my hometown. It's my mom, my grandparents yeah. were there. Yeah, it's really great. <laughs> Exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, that was a great match. And uh, yeah, you all shot very consistent, just a couple arrows out here and there. But again, challenging conditions and uh, kept finding the yellow and the 10 and uh, 6 0 victory. So that's got to feel yeah. good. And, and that you all are uh, not just uh, sneaking your way into the finals, but but definitely deserve to be there and now have a real chance to win. Yeah, yeah. It was just like, and then in the when we were there, we said to our coach, "Okay, now we will. We want to become the world champions. The world champions. We just want to win this today." And um, and he said, "Yeah, it was just the first step, girls. It was just the first step, and we will continue." And so this was the moment where we saw that everything is possible because. Before the match, we did not expect to, to win against Mexico and not 6-0. So, yeah, it was really great. And we were super happy to have the quota and to also have the medal for sure. Yeah. And, uh, and the quota was for the top four teams. Is that right? Um, 
Uh, this was, yeah, this was the, I think the the worst story of the whole world championship because at first they said that the the first um, the first three get the quota and if um, France is in the in the top four, then uh, automatically all others will get the quota. So when we okay. Okay. when we had the team round and when we saw that we are in the semis and also France was in the semis, everyone was like freaking out. Everyone was crying. It was on Wednesday. We were all crying and having interviews and everything. And we were celebrating. And two hours later, um, World Archery came to us and told us that it was a misunderstanding and that um, this was wrong. It was the wrong information and we will get the quota when we win a medal. It doesn't matter what friends will do. Oh so, my gosh. Yes, they they took it from us and yeah, it was a really hot day because like it was an emotional roller coaster. But um yeah. So there we knew that yeah. we will have the quota for sure. <laughs> okay. Wow. That I mean again, another thing that people don't expect is just you prepare so long and you think you have, you and every other team has a clear understanding of exactly what you need to do and how in order to to mm-hmm. get each of these goals, to get quota spots and anything else. And yet there can still be challenges and miscommunication and problems that, uh, ah, yeah, you have to deal with that in the moment. You don't you don't have control. You have to let the coaches and the staff and the and the administrators figure that out and just go back to, my plan is still to shoot the best arrows I can all the time. Uh, obviously it's, I can't pretend it doesn't make a difference, but there's nothing else I can do except kind of go back to the drawing board and, and with my team and, and get ready to, for another match. Yeah. Yeah. It it was, this day was really the most emotional day of my life because I knew that I'm like a, World Championship with Quota Tournament will be emotional. I knew before, but I did not expect that it will be so emotional because I was crying like <laughs> when we, on Wednesday, when we came into the semis, um, we were all together like crying and crying and crying <laughs> because we yeah, were happy. That's a lot. Uh, that's first, a lot. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, <laughs> to be in front of the home crowd, like you said, with, with family and friends and uh national pride uh th- that's a lot that's a lot for one day <laughs> so uh so you finish the semifinal did you immediately have to come back out for the gold or did you have a break uh, we had like a break for 1.5 hours so um, okay. we went um, out of the arena and we tried to stay uh, focused and we went to the training field it was just like five minutes away and i did I shot some arrows, the others just um, relaxed and um, tried to, yeah, just tried to listen to music and to relax, but I shot some arrows again. Okay, so now you're coming back against France, who I'm sure has a has a pretty strong team. I don't know how highly they were ranked, yeah. but um, another another team that presumably is close to home might have a lot of supporters. I'm sure you faced them before. I don't know if uh, if you all get along well or not, but... But, uh, but yeah, definitely a, a, a big, big team to beat for the finals, I presume. Yes, and um, we lost against them at the semifinals at the European Games. So it was a rematch. And at the same time, uh, our coach, Mark Denbach, he was the former coach of the French team. And uh, I have to say that the French girls are like one of my or our best friends from the archery team worldwide. So it mm-hmm. was really great and also before and um, before the match we were standing behind um, the arena and watching the bronze medal match together and we all were hugging each other and saying good luck and i think this also means a lot um and it shows what archery is about because archery is a big family and uh, it's really a, a sport with a big fair play i i agree and that that's really exciting to hear because i think we know there's only so many winners. There's only so many spots on the podium or at the top of the podium, and we can't control that, right? That That's how we set up the sport in order to try to draw the best training, the best preparation, the best technical knowledge out of everybody and to push the sport forward. So I understand that. 
But at the same time, I've seen I've seen a lot of people, including myself, sometimes who get very focused on the competitiveness and the and the not talking mm-hmm. and the not connecting with your opponents as much. And maybe that's a little bit more of uh, our experience on the men's side of things. And and <laughs> I, we've talked to Maddie a little about that before too, and how. Uh, I think a lot of the women's teams have approached the competitions a bit differently. And it's interesting for me now to, to be watching as a fan and as an observer to see a little bit of that, that different dynamic and, and how, how we're all thinking of, about the sport, about this particular match or competition, or about how we fit into this whole you know, community uh, differently based yeah. on, on how we're, we think we're expected to act or how we think we want to act. And, um, yeah, I, I'm just, I think it's fascinating. I don't know if I have any answers as to why people do what exactly, but it's, uh, it's very, um, feels very positive for me watching, um, watching these matches and hearing that to know that again, it's, 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 it's still only one winner, but that doesn't, mean we can't connect with people who at the end of the day really understand us these competitors and these the of ours who uh come from different places in different countries and but in this in a similar way they really understand us maybe even better than some of our neighbors at home sometimes yeah that's true and and i think the the french girls two of them i know since 10 years since i started to shoot internationally so um, it's great also to share this moment with them because it's also for them a big moment. And um, yeah, we grew up together and we all know each other and we know how hard archery can be sometimes. And for them, it also has been a hard season and hard years. And, and they are also really under pressure because of the Olympic Games. And um, yeah, so it's it's nice to share such moments with friends. <laughs> All right, so an uh, hour and a half or so later, um, you got a little bit of rest, a little bit of relaxation maybe from all the emotion of the first match, but uh, now you're coming out here to uh, compete in front of a home crowd for a world championship gold medal. So uh, how does this feel different than the first match? I think we were ma- way more relaxed because the, the first thing we wanted to do was done and it was uh, to win a quota. So it was like, check, we did it and we were able to enjoy it way more. <laughs> there we saw the banana on the stand <laughs> <laughs> because we were, not, we were not allowed to take the banana into the arena. I don't know why, but um, maybe because he sees the show or something, I don't know. And... Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, um, yeah, we tried to enjoy it even more and the crowd was even louder than before because I think they were also really, yeah, relieved (laughs) and just really happy for us. So I think this was the biggest difference. And we also knew um, about the circumstances. We knew how it will feel to shoot in there. Um, We knew that we can shoot good in the arena. So um, we were much more calm. Okay. And now you're shooting on, it looks like the the right target versus the left. So a little different, but presumably the same challenges with wind and communication as before. Uh, Yeah, it was kind of the same. The the wind got a little um, stronger. So as you can see, I shot an eight on the right and I said to Charlie, no, 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 this was not me. Uh, Mm -hmm. You have to aim off. And um, okay. so, yeah, it, it changed a bit and it was also like um, the socks and the flags uh, were moving here. It was the perfect because she aimed on the left <laughs> so and she shot a 10. So, nice. yeah, and the, yeah. as you can see, the flags came from, from the other side. So, um, yeah, it was a lot of communication and, um, yeah. Okay, so so got dialed in on the second (laughs) shot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so definitely um, you all have to be on your toes now watching this, uh, watching where everybody's shooting. Yeah, yes. And um, yeah, there we also saw that we have to be more like focused shot by shot because Michelle was also still 
aiming, like I was aiming and Charlene was aiming, but the wind changed. So afterwards, mm -hmm. we we tried to change this a bit and we tried to communicate as a team before every arrow. So um, okay, yeah, yeah. So that we just check the wind arrow by arrow. I think that's one thing that people forget is that whether it's individual or team competitions, I think the elite teams can typically adjust faster than, than teams that are at that little bit of lower tier. And that isn't necessarily better shooting, but you're getting arrows more quickly closer to the 10 and dialed in. And that picks up a lot of points and that can be a, a lot yes, of difference yes. maker in a lot of matches. Yeah, that's true. And if you all are um, confident in your technique and in your things, then you can trust yourself. And like, now I, I said to Charlie, I made a 100% shot and you can trust me in there. So, um, yeah, it's like a big thing about confidence in your personal thing, but and your teammates also have to trust you. <laughs> yeah, everyone has to yeah. trust everyone in the team. <laughs> so, yeah, this looks is shaping up to be a close end, it looks like. Maybe within one or two points here. Eight. Yeah. So finished there, with an eight. Was so a that's little bit uh, of struggling. Yeah. So fifty three. It looks like. Near. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, that's also that's also something you have to find out because we shot so many team rounds together and um, uh, we know exactly what to say. Like if someone of us, like Michelle, shoots um, two eights in a row. <laughs> It's not a normal thing because she's shooting so much better normally. So we know mm -hmm. exactly what to say to her and, and what she wants to hear. <laughs> um, we know this really well. Yeah. Yeah, you don't want, I mean, you, you want to be able to pick up your teammates in a way that works kind of in their communication style a little bit. Um, some people need different types of support, different types of things to be said. And if you do the opposite, it can make them feel a little bit off. Um, I know for myself, like there's times where you're not shooting well and I don't, I don't want anybody to, to baby me or tell me, Oh, you know, it's going to be okay. It's like, I just need information. <laughs> yeah. Just help. What, what information is going to help me get this next arrow in the 10, but, but yeah, it just, yeah. it's just all different. And, uh, yeah, like you said, knowing each other well enough is, is the biggest step to, uh, to that. Yeah. And that's also the advantage of our team because we shot so many team matches together. So um, uh, we know exactly what the other person is feeling and um, what, he, what he wants to hear. So yeah, that's, it's a really good thing. And that's also a good thing that the, the coaches, um, if they decide the World Championship team, like this year after the second trial, um, we were the team who shot the European Games and the World Cup together. So we had some more competitions to improve our our team and our team spirit and the mm -hmm. communication. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I I'm actually missed it. Uh, what what was the result of this first? They end? tied the, they tied. the first okay. end, fifty three. Okay. Tie, yeah. so, so definitely less than I'm sure both uh, both teams were hoping for, but they both come away with a set point. And now we're uh, same shooting order, so you'll be up first. Look pretty focused here. Yeah, I'm always saying, just doing my technique, just my points, just my technique, nothing else. <laughs> so that's also when you see my lips moving, you can always see I'm talking to myself. You can do it. Yeah. We, you're not alone. Sometimes we can. <laughs> yeah. We can be our our harshest critic, but some I think it's important to always recognize we can also be our biggest supporter. And, and best coach, you know, internal coaching is so important. Yeah. All right. So do you still feel like, um, like the wind is still just as tricky as before? Like you're adjusting almost every arrow? Um, yes, it was like changing. Like one time mm -hmm. you had to aim in the middle and the next one you had to aim like this too. We both aimed in the middle. I, I still can remember because mine was nervous shot, so it went high. 
And mm-hmm. I told Charlie, you can aim in the middle. It will be a 10. And she shot a 10, luckily. <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's also something we had to learn because um, if I say um, to Charlie, yes, aim in the middle and she aims in the middle and she doesn't shoot in the middle, then I could feel bad or she could be mad about me. But um, mm-hmm. we also talked about this so many times and we always say, oh, it's okay. Everyone wants to give her best and everyone wants to um, be the best teammates for the others. So it's okay if you also say some, something wrong or uh, whatever. The archer on the line makes the decision and um, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, it's all important stuff. And again, you when you think of team rounds, sometimes we think, oh, it's just three archers shooting together just (laughs) compiling three scores as if you were all shooting individually, but there's so much nuance and I think there's so much room to, to shoot really well. And I do think that some of the best stuff bleeds over into your individual shooting too. If you have that positive dynamic and that different, um, uh, viewpoints and approaches that, that all the archers have with their various strengths. Um, I think it makes the sport better to, to compete as a group rather than just individually. Yes. All right, so an it's X finally. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then a lot of communication again. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right, so looking to be in a better position here. We're up by one point at the half. A 10-9 to start. So I think... Uh, Michelle has a chance to not necessarily close it out entirely, but to really put a lot of pressure on them with a 10 here. Yes, with a 10, it would be at least a tie. Oh, nice. Okay. So, so, yeah, just a hair out, but I think a little closer than some of her first shots, so it probably feels a little bit better. And now France needs a yes. 29 to tie. Okay. Uh, there you can also see the wind on her senior sling. It was moving. Yeah. Uh, it was quite quite windy on the shooting line, but um, yeah, it, it was important to not focus so much on the wind on the shooting line because it it, it distracted a bit because it seemed to be really strong, but it wasn't that strong sometimes. So mm-hmm. yeah, it was it took us some arrows to come into into the the match. Yeah. Yeah, every venue, every uh, amount is uh, m- amount of wind is different, so you have to learn it, you know, individually for each location you're at. Yeah. So France has some good shots, but again, seems to miss out on the ten for throughout the whole end. Um, I'm sure yeah. they're disappointed in that, but uh, but again, you all have been just keeping that group a little bit tighter and hitting more tens, and that makes a big difference. Um, and now you're up three one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's it's not a good feeling to have an an end without any ten, uh, because you know how fast a match can be over. Because now it's a three one for us, and with one more set, um, if we would win one more set, we would win. So it's, I think it's not yeah. easy for France at this moment. That's my coach from my yeah, hometown but they... with the sunglasses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it, as nervous as you all are, I'm sure that most of your friends and family are probably more nervous. And the reason I say that is because I think archers get so much more chance to practice being nervous and how to deal with it. And they have control, at least some control of the situation, but the friends and family, they don't, they don't practice this. They're, they're kind of just on the spot. Mm. Oh my gosh, we want to go support them. And oh my gosh, they're in the gold medal match. And what if they win? And <laughs> yeah. their heart's probably beaten out of their chest. Yes. And they can't do anything. They just can watch. And I think they yeah. they know they know us and they know how we are feeling. So if we are nervous, they are feeling our nerves and they get nervous too. <laughs> yeah. All right, so France starts off with their first 10 of the match, which I'm sure is uh, feels good for them. Oh, and another X, okay. Well. Yeah, yeah they're getting, great, getting a little a more confidence start. here. Yeah, 
So in this kind of position, are you all um, just focusing on yourselves and, and continuing to stay in your group and not think or watch them? Or do you do you happen to notice and hear the, mm -hmm. you know, all the announcements of the scores? I think in this uh, in this situation, we did not even recognize that they were shooting so good because we were so focused with ourselves. And um, here I had a B on my side. Can you see it? It, it was oh. that I shot a seven. Yeah. Let me let me because pause it and rewind little, just a second. Yeah, the B she sat on my arm when I went to the shooting line, and then she went to my side. It was really annoying. Yeah. And I'm still. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh right. my gosh. Yeah, yeah, right there. Yeah. <laughs> so that's uh, that's a challenge. So. Yeah. So so that was a bit distracting in the, in that shot. Yes, it was really distracting. Yeah. And yeah. I think. Dang it. Normally, I should just let down, because we would have enough time. But at this mo in this moment, I did not think about letting down. So next time, I would maybe let yeah. down. <laughs> Yeah, it's a hard call sometimes because, you know, you want to get so locked in to just even if a there's a gunshot nearby, you're still focusing on your execution and yeah. feeling your clicker and your shot. But but yeah, sometimes you just recognize, dang it, like I was too focused and intent on executing the shot that I actually should have, you know, let down and reset. But uh, that's that you have to make a split decision, split second call and uh Usually, yeah. I think we all, especially in a finals venue with all the adrenaline and the focus and potentially the last end, um, we want to just execute the shot. Yeah, and I think it's also something like, um, normally it should not distract me. So, like, of course, it did um, distract me, but I maybe also did not want to show or something, but yeah, it was okay that yeah. everyone was gone and... They shot really well. You can see they shot another 10. So just one eight so yeah. far and the rest 10. Yeah, so they have a chance and even ends, with a yeah. seven here maybe to, or a eight to close out the end. And they get another 10. So wow. big yeah. bounce back for them. Looks like five tens, maybe a liner. Yeah, and it was good for us because our coach told us, yes, uh, this end is gone and just keep focusing and try to find a solution for the next end mm -hmm. to get back. Yeah, so we yeah. had our weekend in the in the right moment because 58 is, uh, is the end from the <coughs> others, which is really good. So yeah. it's okay if they make points with it. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, every end is different and... I think over the long period of time, obviously the arrow average kind of sorts itself out with set points and, and who wins or ties ends. But sometimes, I mean, matches are short and a lot can happen. And mm. I, it seemed like you all shot very well and, and worked hard to, to get uh, three, get up three, one and get three of those first four set points. But, but now, yeah, like something happened at the same time that they were shooting well. And it's like, well, you had a bit of a cushion so that, you know, shooting well yeah. early gives you that. Um, and now you, you have to reset for uh, a, a tie game at 3-3. Uh, three, three. Yeah, and that's the mo now it's the most important end because the winner of the next end will win, this, win the match. So, um, yeah, yeah it was, I think it was good for us to have this weak end in uh, this moment because at the last three arrows, we just aimed in the middle and we, uh, we to check the win. And um, so we had time to communicate and get ready for the the most important end. And yeah. yeah. So yeah, and you're still and focused, the, even though um, yeah. even though you had uh, you know maybe had a chance to close it out that end, but it, it slipped a little bit. Now you're just refocused on there's more arrows to shoot and. You can't think about the bee or the fly or, or the wind or anything. Um, <laughs> you just go back to what you all know how to do. Yes, and it was also an advantage, I think, to start this end. So um, it was good to make our thing and they can do their thing after. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's why most top-ranked uh, recurve teams like to shoot first. All right, so great second shot. Yes, it's exactly for situations like this. Really nice. 
Great second shot, uh, right almost dead center X. And another good nine, 9.5, 9.6. So a 28 to start. That's, I think, better than the arrow average so far. Again, challenging conditions. So that puts some pressure on France. Yes, I think uh, all three in the yellow and 110 is a really good start for such an important end. All right, so left nine for France to start. Yeah, they were also communicating a lot about the wind. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of difficult. <laughs> Ooh, another X. Okay, nice. good shot. Now I'm nervous again. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should check my adrenaline right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so they matched oh, it with a 28. Hi. Oh my gosh. So we've gone the whole entire match so far just to all come down to being tied with three arrows left. Yes, so that's uh, super exciting. Mm. Oh, nice That's shot. gotta feel good. Oh. High that X. Was, that yeah. was an important one. Yeah. It's good to start like this. The the last three arrows. Yeah, just gives uh, some confidence to your teammates to go out and do the same thing. Yeah, and it's also good for the opponents because they hear like X, and it's um. It yeah. Shows that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so a left nine, um, that's pretty good. You're still getting about a 9.5 average here. So see yeah. if and Michelle can. And you said to Michelle, you have to aim out. off. You have to aim off because the arrow was flying like this. I showed to her and she aimed off a bit to the right, I think. And she shot an X. Good and shot. With an X. Great finish. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So and best I, end I of the match, right? Moment, and in this moment, I said, no. We can't lose with this score. Please, dear God, we can't lose. And Michelle was saying to me, <laughs> at first, they have to shoot at 29. <laughs> and then um, they shot the first time. Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> this is tough. This is challenging, but it's exciting. And, and you yeah. try and train for yeah. this and put yourself in these positions. And I feel for France, too, having two archers left and needing two tens yeah. just to tie. The pressure is super high, I think, for for them. So this was a the good moment. shot, wow. but just out. Yeah, and now you all are probably we... realizing that, yeah, there's there's no line breakers, there's probably no calls, and yeah. oh my gosh, we were we were already uh, crying because our coach, he said in this moment, he just said, "Thank you, girls, for this end," because yeah, he left us after the world championship, so. We were really emotional together with him and oh my gosh. Yeah, super relieved. Oh wow. <laughs> and then super happy. <laughs> yeah. Because it's just, you, it was we work so hard. Yeah. Yeah, we work so hard in archery to to try to put ourselves in a position and we never know what's gonna happen, but but sometimes it starts to work and it starts to go even farther than maybe we imagined and you just you just keep going. You just do your best and, and uh, oh my gosh. Nice. And everything well, congratulations. This is, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's really exciting. And again, you, you feel for France, they came so close and they shot very well. Um, but again, like you, you guys shot on average better and, uh, and better in crucial moments and uh, you deserve to enjoy it all. Yes, and it, it was super great because the the atmosphere in this arena it was so so great because um the yeah the people were so emotional and I think we took all their emotions also in a positive way for us and we we felt these emotions and um, yeah so many uh, persons on the stand were crying because of us and because of our gold medal and. Um, yeah, it's, it's really, really great and just um, these are memories, they will stay in my heart forever. And um, that's really nice yeah. to see. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and hope to just spread that good feeling to, again, we, we can't always win, uh, but we can definitely 
talk about all these positive things that we've tried to do over time that have led to the chance at being on a podium or a chance at winning a gold medal and hope that motivates and inspires other people because it's uh, it's really exciting and it it reminds us, I think, why we got into the sport and what we enjoy so much about it. And I think a lot of other people will will find the same thing. Yeah, that's, that's true. And I hope that we inspire so many uh, people in Germany or anywhere at the world that um, if you are there in the right moment, everything is possible because nobody expected us to win the World Championship. And also, I think not even ourselves expected it. We hoped to do it, but uh, we wished for it, but um, we did not expect. But it was possible just with being a team and just focus on ourselves and uh, work hard. <laughs> and yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. Yeah, exciting. Ah, very emotional. But uh, yeah. but again, I think there's so many there's so many good lessons to be learned, and that's why I think we're excited to be able to talk with people and break them down and and bring a lot of this information to the forefront. Because obviously, everybody recognizes that shooting well and winning is is exciting and is motivating and and does help people learn about the sport and improve the sport. But there's a lot of information that um, that is is a little harder to draw out or a little harder to communicate and. Uh, We really appreciate you going through all this with us because I think it, it makes a big difference in people's lives and their their shooting careers to be able to uh, to learn from other people. Um, so we really appreciate all your insight and willingness to share with us um, all the all the amazing stuff that you all did this past year. Yeah, I think it's super great that someone um, really cares about this and wants to show this because, as you say, most them. Um, People around the world just see the the guys on the podium with the medals and with a big smile. But um, you also should watch everyone behind the podium and who's not on there and um, the way to the podium because it's um, it can be really hard and frustrating and yeah and sometimes you just don't want to shoot but you just have to continue and to keep the discipline and to hold the vision and just trust um, the process. Yeah. Well, geez, I, uh, that was a lot for me <laughs> to take in. Um, all of our, all of our podcasts with, with archers are, are unique and interesting in their own way, but I think this was the first one we had done on team rounds specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is uh big for us and, and some new dynamics and new things to learn. Um, and again, tied in with the, the, uh, The, a little bit of pressure or emotionality of the uh, the Olympic quota spots as well uh, with this world championship. Um, but yeah, so maybe maybe coming down from some of this height of emotion a little bit. <laughs> so what what first question I have is um, I, I'm really curious with top athletes like yourself where people put their kind of emotions or focus in in the context of archery and where where maybe you feel like you sit on the scale from very very intense and serious about your shooting to more loose and relaxed and just doing it for fun how would you describe where you sit on that scale of intensity i think um uh, it, it's a hard question because i think it it changed um because at first i was like really strict and super focused and um, now I'm like much more enjoying archery so um, it, I think it has it has to be a good um, combination of both and I try to do this because in competitions I try to be super focused on myself and on my technique but at the same time I always when I'm going to the shooting line or When I'm not shooting, I try to enjoy and to be relaxed and to just, um, I try to not be, have so much tension in my body because it's, um, it's easier for me to make my, my shot or clean shot if I'm like relaxed and I don't have so much tension. I hope this was kind of clear. So I would, I would say I'm like in the middle. <laughs> yeah. 
No, that's that's a great answer. I think a lot of times when archers are watching other better archers, uh, especially on on the world stage or on the you know maybe it's the podium or, or bigger events, a lot of times people can present a very serious and intense look and demeanor, and I think it's very tempting to try to copy that in a little bit of the wrong way. And for a younger archer to think, oh, this archer looks, they look serious when they're on the shooting line. So maybe I need to be very, very serious about archery and I mm-hmm. have to really focus hard and I have to really, really try hard. And th- this is, this is about being serious and about performing. But the more top athletes I talk to, the more I'm starting to see a trend that it's really more about uh, yes, focusing and making sure that you're controlling where your attention goes, but balancing that with a very healthy dose of fun and enjoyment and just passion for the sport mm-hmm. so that you're actually making competition an enjoyable experience rather than one that's just stressful and full of just too much tension all all the whole time you're competing. Yeah, that that's true because I think that's also a problem of many young archers that they are too, too focused and they want it of everyone wants to shoot good, but in, you can't want it too too bad because um, you have to at first you have to make your your thing on the shooting line and then you can see what's the result on the target face or on a podium or on a on a result list or wherever. But you of, at first mm-hmm. you always have to make your job, and I think making a job is much easier when you make it with a smile or if you enjoy what you're doing. Because it takes a lot of, um, it makes it just more relaxed. And um, yeah, and I'm always thinking that um, it's for me, it's like, I'm so grateful to do the thing I love, archery, around the world and to meet people who also love archery around the world. And um, when you're shooting good, then it's like a privilege because it's, it's just the best thing that can happen to you. Yeah, thanks for that insight. So after having a very intense year with a lot of ups and downs, started with a lot of stress and uncertainty, like you told us earlier, um, do you have a big summary lesson of what you're learning from this year that you feel sets you up well going into 2024? Anything that you're trying to optimize or do differently? Uh, yes, I will. I will do many things differently because. Um, this year I, I changed like I, ch- I changed my training completely and I think I will uh, stay with this structure like um, doing more to prevent injuries or whatever um, and I think it's super important for me and it, it helps me to get yeah, to, fo- to feel ready with a lot of strength training so I think I will stick with that and I also try to stop thinking that high volume is always the thing. Um, so more quality, um, more different training things. And I, once again, I learned that I have to believe in myself <laughs> and, and that I just because you're making a break or just because you're having a bad week or a bad month, you, should not lose your confidence because you're still a good archer and you still can perform good. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but it's still inside you. And um, I'm sure, I hope um, to come back in the, the the best shape ever. And I'm sure I can come. I'm really sure I can come back and I want to be on the top of the world again. And um, yes, I try to believe in this and in myself. Well, we believe in you too. And uh, I think no. from, from how much of a fighter you've shown to be so far, there's pretty good odds we'll see you back on the top of the rankings again very soon. Thank you. <laughs> so I also have a question too. We've had a lot of, uh, a lot of um, archers or, or even pro staff ask us to talk with top shooters on our pro staff about how, what stabilizers they use and, and how they set them up. So I'm curious what specific uh, model and lengths that you use and how you like to configure it and how you like to kind of tune and set up your, your stabilizer balance. Okay, that's a good question because um, seriously, the, I'm, I'm asking the boys to do it for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, I'm shooting okay. the detector. Okay. Last year, I shot the the ultra, and but okay. this year I decided to to go with the others, um, because I I tested both, and the damping was better with the uh, factor. Okay. I'm shooting a 30 inch long, and a 13.5 for the side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just going for my feeling because because my shot is really really fast. So I need a bow um, which is quite stable from the beginning until the end, um, which is like stable. But at the same time, I can uh, correct um, a lot with my bow hand because if there's wind, um, I don't have much time to, to stay in the anchor and to move because I'm shooting fast. So um, I'm searching for a setup um, which is stable, but at the same time, um, yeah, I, yeah, not stable. <laughs> Yeah. Some something you just have a little more control. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, that's it. And um when I release I want to have a bow which um flaps out quite fast. And so I'm always um putting a lot of weight on the front. I don't know exactly how much I have at the moment because I'm changing it. Like when I'm feeling stronger one day, I just put one more weight on and I'm not I I'm not someone who always sticks with the same setup. I try to, to just um, yeah, adjust where however I feel. And when there's a lot of wind, when I know like before there were championships, I know there will be a lot of wind on the field. So I made the setup a bit um, heavier, and I also put them um, a bit more on the side drop, so that um, yeah, it's more stable. And so. Because I knew that I maybe have to shoot a bit um, slower to wait for the gas. Okay. It's like I'm I'm testing and I'm I before before the season I'm always thinking or I already know um, how my bow should feel, and then I'm just testing and testing and in competitions I'm testing because I think in training you can find many good setups, but the competitions are the things that count and um when you're like feeling that you're you can't aim that steady then just put one more weight in the front one more on the side and just test i would recommend yeah and do you use an extension yes i'm using a um, three three inch okay yeah and that helps yes. you get that balance a little bit more forward as well yeah yeah exactly okay I like to have it a bit more down, but just a little bit. And because, I don't know, it makes me feel more stable. But I also, um, some years I shot it um, straight. But since I think for two or three years, I'm shooting it a bit down. I think it's um, eight or nine ounces on the front. And okay. four, four on the side. So it's like half on okay. the side than in the front. Okay. And do you use the the stabilizers with the tungsten damping inside or no? No. <laughs> no. Oh, okay. okay. I, I tried, but it's, for me personally, they are weight uh, a bit too heavy. And do you like using any like rubber uh, dampers on between the weights or between the stabilizers and the weights? Um, yes, I'm using uh, the from Bita Archery, the V-boxes. Mm-hmm. They fit perfectly with the stabilizers, and I think they are really looking good on the Renrod stabilizers. <laughs> okay, nice. All right, so so one biter V box on all three of the, uh, the on all stacks. three, yes, but with okay. uh, different um, um, insights because you can change the the thickness or the damping, yeah. like kind of. And I yeah. also tested, and I have a really stiff one on the front and. A really weak one on the side. And do you like to put that V box right up against the stabilizer, and then all the weights on the outside, or do you like split the weight stack half and half? Yeah, I split it. Normally, I put one or two ounces in between the stabilizer and the V box, and the rest um, outside. Awesome. Well, I think that covers it for the uh, the equipment setup and preferences, and and again, what you're looking for when you're uh, <laughs> aiming or drawing back and setting up everything. It's just so so customizable that I think we often forget or or like we can see the pictures, but it, you know there's a lot more to it 
um, as far as details, as far as the philosophy that people have when they set up their stabilizers that I think is important for us to know um, as we design things, but also for, for other pro staff or athletes to know as far as how people look to uh, put their, their bow together. Yeah, it's like I'm, I'm a testing person because I just like to, to feel it. And I just like a bow which feels confident for me <laughs> and which also um, is good for my technique. So I just would recommend to test. I also tried a shorter long rod, like 27, but it was for my, for my shot timing, it, the bow moved down to, to quick. So the 30 inch was way better for me personally. So I would just recommend okay. to test if you have the possibility, just test, test, test. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I think that covers most everything we were looking to talk about today. We covered the world championship itself, the matches, the preparation specifically for that tournament. We covered some archery philosophy, some stabilizers, some lessons learned. Um, but yeah, I, I think, uh, I think there's a lot of good info here that, that we appreciate. And then I think a lot of viewers will appreciate too. And, um, yeah, we're, we're definitely rooting for you, uh, throughout the rest of this winter and upcoming year and, uh, look Thank forward you. to hopefully providing you and, and your team with some more, hopefully information and products to help you all shoot your best. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for your help. Thanks for your support. And, uh, if I can do anything for you guys, then just let me know. I'm always open to help you and to increase your company. Sure. We appreciate that a lot. Um, we, we've been very fortunate, I think, to, to work with you and a lot of other great people and great athletes um, over the years. And, and it's very exciting for us. Um, we've always loved archery, and now we get to work with a lot of, uh, a lot of smart, hardworking, great archers. So it's, it's exciting for us, too. Yeah, it's super cool that also so many compounds, good compounds, are also using your stabilizers. I think it's, you can be really proud, and I'm also really proud to be part of the team for a couple of years now and see how it, it's increasing. It's really great. Sure, we appreciate that a lot. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, that wraps up this episode of Follow Through by Ramrod's Archery. I am Josh Smith. This is Joe Fanchon. We appreciate you guys watching, and we will catch you in the next one.